just taking a look at this cutaway of an excavator uh, travel drive. Uh, we've got a uh, hydraulic piston motor here that's attached to a planetary reduction unit with a sprocket to drive the track of an excavator. And there's a planetary type uh, final drive assembly here as well that we'll look at. So most excavators are going to have two speed travel. They're going to have some type of a rabbit turtle switch or a uh, speed selection switch in the cab. And I'll just reference this, uh, just referencing the Caterpillar 307 here, for example. There is a uh, switch here that shows a rabbit and the undercarriage of the track. So we've got fast travel speed. If that's turned off, we're in low travel speed. And then with, as is the case with any variable displacement motor, if the uh, motor is in its largest displacement position, it will be in slow speed. The larger the motor, the more oil it takes to turn at one revolution. It'll have higher torque, but it'll be at a lower speed. And then if it's in a reduced displacement position, that'll be fast speed. The oil will process through the motor faster and it will turn faster. So it's opposite of a pump as far as the relationship between speed and displacement. Um, this particular motor is a uh, bent axis style. So there's a fork here that uh, is hooked up to an actuator that, dry, that moves the barrel and port plate to, there we are in a greater uh, bend of its axis. So that would be our low speed position at its highest displacement where the stroke of the pistons is the longest. And then I can move it to minimum displacement which would be our fast speed low torque position. And then, as mentioned, this particular unit, there's a, a double acting piston here, basically an actuator connected to this pin and a fork that moves the port plate. And because of the convex concave relationship and a center pin in the, in the barrel assembly, in the rotating group, the barrel follows that unit as it changes its displacement. So again, there is there's maximum displacement for low speed, minimum displacement for high speed. And most excavators will have a two speed motor. It's variable displacement, but it's not infinitely variable. It'll basically be in one position or the other. And of course, there's gonna be two travel motors left and right, and they're gonna to shift together. When that switch is turned to the high speed position in the cab, a solenoid valve is going to come on, send oil down through the swivel, the center rotary joint of the machine down, and it will tee off in the car body and run to the displacement control on both travel motors. If an excavator has conventional hydraulic drive, there are a few excavators out in the marketplace. I know Bobcat made one for a period of time that had a uh, hydrostatic, separate hydrostatic drive system for the uh, for the travel, but I'm talking about an excavator where there's basically travel spool valves in the main DCV dedicated to traveling left and traveling right. So we've got a, again, a, a bi-directional motor here. The main hoses would connect here for forward and here for reverse or vice versa, but two hoses are gonna connect for your high pressure, high flow connections for forward and reverse. And then there'll be a case drain line coming off the top because it's a piston motor. So case drain line on this one came off here, ran up through the swivel and back to the hydraulic tank. Some machines might filter that, some may not. Depends on the manufacturer. And then there, of course there's going to also be a, a pilot line from that two speed solenoid coming to the actuator piston to move it back and forth. And then we've got our uh, cross port reliefs here limiting maximum travel pressure. So these are generally sort of a staged relief to provide some cushioning effect when the, uh, when the relief actually has to open. And uh, generally these reliefs are set higher than the main, usually a few hundred PSI higher than your main relief for traveling. So they're not going to limit travel torque. That's not their job. They're in there to um, cushion the stopping of the machine 
when the operator stops sending oil down to the travel motor and the inertia or the weight of the machine wants to keep that sprocket turning, the few revolutions of the motor that are going to happen as a result of that uh, reduction unit powering the motor and turning it into a pump because the operator stopped sending oil to it, it's going to start pumping oil. It'll pump it over the relief valve and that'll provide some dynamic braking to stop the machine. So the stopping isn't so abrupt. It's still fairly abrupt, but the relief valves are, are cushioning that stop. So two-speed motor, we've got two relief valves in here. We'll have a case drain line. We'll have our forward and reverse connections. Uh, and then inside this motor, you can see there's a spool valve built in here. That is a counterbalance valve. And most excavator travel motors are going to have a counterbalance valve. And what that's going to do is prevent high-speed downhill operation. As is the case with any motor, if it turns faster because of inertia or gravity, if the operator is trying to travel down a hill really fast, especially if the engine's at low idle, there won't be much oil coming to the forward or reverse port, depending which way we're going. And once again, that reduction unit, the planetary sets, that normally reduce the speed of the sprocket. Once the excavator's mass and gravity start driving that sprocket, this travel motor could be doing thousands of RPM. And as it's going at a really high speed and we're not sending much oil to it, it can cavitate or run, run devoid of oil, and that's going to damage all the metal parts in there. So to prevent the operator from being able to basically freewheel down a hill, the counterbalance valve provides a counterbalance function, which in hydraulics means that you can't let oil out of the circuit unless you have restriction or pressure on the supply side of the circuit. So if I'm going forward, sending oil in here, oil will go in and try and turn the motor, but on the way out, it will have to build some pressure here at the counterbalance valve spool, which will cause then pressure on the supply side, which will move that spool down. And moving that spool down will then let oil out of the motor back towards the swivel, back towards the control valve, back to tank. If the excavator starts to freewheel down a steep hill and the operator isn't interested in slowing down, uh, what will happen is because there will be less restriction to flow as the weight of the machine starts to freewheel this motor, there won't be much restriction to flow. So the pressure here, the supply coming from the valve will drop the pressure that was holding the counterbalance valve spool will drop, the centering springs will start to center it, and that will choke off the oil coming out the return side. So it'll provide some dynamic braking, some eff effectively some braking that will slow the machine down at requiring the system to build pressure again here on the supply to keep that counterbalance valve shifted. That's basically the same function as a pilot lock valve in implement hydraulics. Uh, but you'll see this called a counterbalance valve spool, you'll see it often in excavator travel motors. There's also load check valves in here. We're used to seeing load checks in the, uh, in the directional control valve, but there's load checks inside a travel motor because when you start traveling, if you're on an uphill grade, we don't want the excavator rolling backwards. So a load check will kind of be like a load holding valve in this case, requiring a sort of a positive uh, pressure before, uh, again, before the uh, counterbalance valve will shift and let oil out of the far side. There's an internal brake in here, wet multi-disc type brake, a spring applied brake. There's Belleville spring washers in there that clamp the uh, plates and discs together. Uh, half of the uh, elements are splined to the rotating group, the other half are splined to the housing. So when the excavator isn't trying to travel, that brake is spring applied. It's a parking brake. That's not what stops the excavator from traveling. Again, we get dynamic braking when the uh, operator lets off the travel control. The relief valves are gonna tr control the stopping. But after a few seconds, oil that was uh, uh, releasing a piston and releasing the uh, brake against the Belleville Springs that oil will drain out and the parking brake will apply after you stop. So the friction material is not designed to stop the machine, it's designed to hold a parked machine. So an excavator like this one, when it's parked in the shop here, uh, the brakes are applied. That can make it tricky to tow a machine 
you got a disabled excavator and you need to tow it back to the shop. Uh, some manufacturers may provide some method of releasing the brake, be it providing uh, oil pressure to the piston through a porta power pump or some other uh, remote uh, pressure source. Uh, but even then, you've got an issue because the relief valves are not going to want to let the oil in or out along with the counterbalance valve. So usually what an, a manufacturer is going to re require for you to tow a, a disabled machine like this is to take the final drive apart. They may, some manufacturers may have you take the cover off, remove the sun gear, put the cover back on. Uh, some machines, the ring gear is actually bolted to the cover, so you take the cover off the final drive, take the ring gear off, put the cover back on. Uh, of course, you got to clean everything so you're not contaminating the system and uh, you're going to be inadvertently changing your final drive oil. Uh, but at that time, also be aware that, you know, once you've removed an element of the final drive, you have no, no brakes. So if you're towing the machine any distance, you're going to want to use two machines, one to provide braking and one to uh, actually tow the machine so it's not uh, going to take off on you. Um, this brake in this particular manufacturer's uh, brake, there's a pressure reducing valve as well in this, uh, in the head of the travel motor that when you drive forward or reverse, uh, it, the oil pressure goes through a pressure reducing valve and then releases the brake. Unlike swing drives and swing motors we've seen where there's a pilot line that comes to the uh, unit to release the brake with pilot pressure, there is no line running down through the swivel to release the brake. We've only got four hoses generally connecting to one of these motors. Our high pressure, high flow lines for forward and reverse, a case drain line coming off, and then our two-speed pilot to activate the displacement change. So there's no brake release, so it's actually system pressure that's going to release the brake. In some excavator travel motors, they'll send full drive pressure in, and the seals on the brake piston can handle that, and they may send as much as 5,000 or 5,500 PSI right to the brake piston. In this particular excavator, as you drive forward or reverse, there's a shuttle valve in here that indexes oil to a pressure reducing valve and the pressure reducing valve drops the pressure that is required to release the brake to I think around 1000 PSI, but I'm not familiar with the spec exactly on this one. But again, this one's Ben Axis, uh, two-speed Ben Axis motor. Our 307 excavator has axial piston motors, which are typically more common. Looking at the schematic for that, motor we were just looking at, if I can get this to focus a little better, there's the lines coming down through the swivel. In this particular machine there's uh, six lines that travel through the swivel. There's two high pressure high flow lines for the for the left travel motor, two high pressure high flow lines for the right travel motor, then there's a pilot line that comes in uh, to actuate the uh, two-speed or the displacement change and it just tees at the bottom of the car body at the bottom of the swivel and both motors shift together. You don't have one in high and one in low speed. They are either both in high speed or they're both in low speed. And then there's a case drain here where it says DR that's carrying a case drain from the two piston motors. Again, it tees together usually at the bottom of the swivel and then travels up through the swivel and heads back to the reservoir or the tank. So in here, you can see where the uh, lines come in from travel, from the swivel. Again, high pressure, high flow. They come in. Uh, if I'm going forward and oil's coming in P1 here, it hits this spool valve you can see in the motor. That's our counterbalance valve, which won't let the oil cross here, but the oil can still get to the motor. It comes up through that load check valve we saw, and then it comes up to the motor, and it'll try and drive the motor around. Um, of course, we've got to release the brake, but then as the oil relieves the other side of the motor and comes back, uh, it's, uh, it, hits this, it hits this load check and, it, and then it's forced to cross the counterbalance valve. Well, the counterbalance valve is closed, as you can see in this position, so that will cause pressure then to build up on the supply side and the pressure will push the counterbalance valve spool over to the right and then that will index this, uh, this drain line over to here to let oil out across the counterbalance valve. So again, the counterbalance valve is going to require us, require us to have pressure on the forward side before we can let oil out of the reverse side and vice versa. 
And then again, we've got uh, cross port reliefs in here. So two relief valves, and there's a bit of dampening, uh, sort of a, a, a spring type accumulator built into those relief valves. It's tiny, it looks big here, but that provides some dampening effect for the uh, relief action. And then we've got our displacement change uh, valve in the motor, and then we've got the actual actuator that changes the displacement of that bent axis type uh, motor. And then the brake, we've got a spring applied brake up here, and there's that pressure reducing valve that reduces the pressure going to the actual brake piston on this manufacturer's travel device. So again, and again, we've got a shuttle valve here, and it's actual drive pressure that goes in through a pressure reducing valve, and it's drive pressure forward or reverse that's going to release the brake. And the brake piston chamber, you can see where the spring, where the Belleville spring is, they're just showing it's connected to the case drain that connects and goes out. So we've got displacement change basically in this area. We've got the brake here. We've got our reliefs here for forward and reverse. And then we've got our counterbalance valve section here. And the left and right motors are basically identical. A little, little more complicated than the swing motor for the swing device um, because of the counterbalance function and because we're using system pressure to release the brake rather than just pilot pressure coming in like we did on the swing. And then we've got two spool valves for travel. This particular uh, excavator, they're side by side in the control valve. This is a Hitachi, uh, 20 ton Hitachi, an EX200-2 that I'm using for example. And uh, the two spool valves feed again to the swivel and the lines from the swivel travels down, travel down to the motors. This particular excavator is, uh, has load sensing hydraulics, so they're closed center valves, but there's lots of excavators that use open center hydraulics, as does our 307 out there. And on this 307, we have our two travel valves, our two travel spools. They're closest to the middle of the valve here where the lines come on the back and the two pumps feed. Uh, one pump feeds this side of the control valve where we've got our uh, left travel spool valve and the other pump feeds this side of the control valve where we've got our right travel spool. So on this excavator, one pump feeds the right track, the other pump feeds the left track. On the Hitachi excavator, both pumps tee together and feed all functions in the control valve. In this era of Caterpillar excavator, um, because each travel is fed from one pump or the other, and this is an open center valve, an inadvertent issue that can arise, if I'm using, let's say, the right travel, and I'm, and I'm tra or I'm traveling with both tracks, and at the same time I use one of the other hydraulic functions on this side of the, the valve, let's say the bucket. If, if oil wants to go to the bucket rather than travel, because that's the path of least resistance, the, it's gonna rob oil from one track, and the machine might just start to steer crooked because oil is going to take the path of least resistance. So what this era of Caterpillar excavator has is what they call a straight travel valve. And that straight travel valve is an automatic function. It's a, it's a spool valve, but there's no pilot line going to the end of it here. It's, it's, autom it's automatically operated via what they call the logic network within this valve. And what will happen in this valve, if you have both travels being operated together, Again, your left track's running off of one pump, your right track's running off of the other pump. If you touch an implement function at the same time, the logic in this valve will automatically shift the straight travel valve. And the straight travel valve rearranges the pump flows coming into the DCV. One pump will begin to feed both travel spools, and so you'll drop down to about half speed because you've gone from two pumps feeding your travel to one. But you'll continue to travel straight and then the other pump will feed any, any or all of the implements that are being used. So when you travel and use an implement on this excavator, your travel slows right down uh, to about half speed because you're reducing the pump flow, supplying the travel circuits. But that's, you know, it's a compromise. We're losing some speed, but it keeps the machine traveling straight because then the one pump's going to continue to feed the two, two track spools. But if you're just traveling with both travels, then again, one pump will feed each, each side of the control valve. So one pump will be feeding the right track motor, one will be feeding the left track motor. Um, if you're traveling with one 
side and you use an implement, then the tra straight travel valve does not need to activate, actuate. If you're, uh, but if you're using that magic combination of both travel left and right and any one of the implements, be it bucket, boom, stick, swing, attachment, then the straight travel valve will, will actuate. 